I've seen a lot of videos or articles bemoaning the authoritarian left or the woke left or the strident fundamentalist left. And I want to um, acknowledge that sometimes when people are writing things like that or making critiques, there's something there that is important. And I want to highlight that. There are real problems in different sectors of the left. Now, first of all, there's no such thing as the left. And when we're saying the left, we have to be careful and really be specify what we're talking about. Because in the United States, the left isn't very left. You know, you could argue we don't have any leftists in power. Um, you could argue we have progressives, which aren't necessarily the same thing. And that's a whole big messy pile to unpack. From, from my purposes, I'm going to define the left at the very base minimum, and this is problematic, I'll acknowledge. The left, generally speaking, um, traditionally has been divided between um, people who think capitalism is bad and those who don't. Okay, so the leftist, a leftist at the very least should be someone who is strongly sympathetic with some form of socialism. Now, I would like to broaden that out because that tends to be kind of a class essentialist sort of argument. And part of the big critique that has happened, um, and it's been important, is to recognize that that's a very Eurocentric kind of way of framing things. And so, and this is already like sounding woke to me, lots of you, but the left, and part of what makes it complicated, is it's a constellation of varying concerns about varying kinds of oppressions that are centered around varying um, types of authoritarianism and hierarchies of power. Okay? So you have colonialism, you have white supremacy, you have patriarchy, you have cis-heteronormativity, you have all these different kinds of authoritarian systems that are all expressed in different institutions and they all intersect and reinforce each other and it's messy holy shit to an outsider to any one of those systems it ends up seeming seeming puritanical so i'm white so if i'm observing all this and i step into a context like black lives matter and I step into someone's pain and struggle and I end up saying stuff that triggers a memory or a nerve. It harkens back to some pain. It, it stumbles into some of my cluelessness. It recapitulates some harm. I end up doing harm. All of a sudden, to me as an outsider, and this connects back to my video, link below, um, to confusing interpersonal stuff with social stuff. All of a sudden, I might think that they're reacting to me interpersonally as though I fucked up as a bad person. And so I'm going to react now as though they're calling me a bad person. A lot of these people who end up having this knee-jerk reaction to hashtag woke ways of thinking came up as evangelicals. And so they are quick to say, you know what? You know who else is a fundamentalist? These leftists. It's the fundamentalism of the left. And what they're doing is they don't realize that they're the ones who are still stuck in a fundamentalist way of thinking. So here's what ends up happening. They react to someone who is challenging the baked in way of whiteness that I just manifested right and I react as a white person interpersonally to their systemic critique and I think they're being puritanical like a fundamentalist and then I go on a diatribe about how the left is too woke and so I just made a fundamental category confusion I somehow pitched the whole thing in the category of purity and morality when they're approaching things generally speaking through the category of social systems and security
and safety. So let me make this personal for me. And it just so happens that the trans movement is kind of the movement du jour that people talk about when it comes to woke authoritarianism. Because you have people like Dave Chappelle, who people are hand-wringing about being canceled. Now, it's interesting that you don't use language like cancellation when you're talking about, oh, I don't know, uh, a Christian minister whose career prospects suddenly tank when they come out as a trans woman. Usually cancellation is only the language we talk about with the powerful or the influential. That's interesting to know. What does that say? You hear the way that people talk about trans folks is that they have to walk on eggshells around us, that we're some sort of cultural uh, elite. Um, and it's the language is all around performativity, as though um, people have to say and do the right things for fear of being caught and being penalized. As though the goal is to rigidly perform to purity codes or they will be punished. Now there is something to that because part of the strategy is to change languages, language and norms around these things to create counter systems, counter myths, counter uh, structures that make it people not transphobic as the default setting. And you know, this ties into the previous video that I made around social systems, right? And so it makes sense that we would call attention to harmful language. And there are ways of doing that that are um, overly punitive, and there are ways to do that that are more helpful. So yeah. However, the overall goal is not to just overly punish in a draconian way. Now, when people focus on this sort of way of thinking about stuff, as though it's purely some sort of fundamentalist, puritanical sort of regime, uh, they're missing the point. Rather, I'm being driven by an ethic of security. I just want to be able to feel safe and entirely validated in the world. I want, I don't want to feel a, like a lesser than. I want to know that the world can entirely affirm and accept me for who I am. Not only that, celebrate the unique contributions I bring to the full extent that they celebrate any and everyone else's and that I can be just as integrated and indispensable in society as everyone else. And I want to see a society that is built upon that. I do not want to see a society or be a part of a society that marginalizes me. Now, what ends up happening is people who aren't trans don't understand and see that. They just see the system as being kind of fair and don't have the capacity because they don't have much at stake in this. They don't see the ways that I'm marginalized. So they just see me making a lot of stink over nothing. They see me being bent out of shape over very little. They see me being agitated over no big deal. And so then what they see as me being punitive and overreactive and canceling poor, poor Dave Chappelle is actually me just asserting a very basic, usually very low standard of common decency. And this is a problem. If my <laughs> low assertion for common decency causes such a reaction that people think it's authoritarian, then I don't know what's gonna happen when I start asking for full, full acceptance and full celebration. But this idea that wokeism has run amok, it makes the fundamental mistake that people that are being woke are all just being driven by ideological purity and they're attacking people out of a fundamentalist instinct. And while there is some of that, 
a lot of us are just trying to feel secure and trying to create a society where we can be secure. Now, there are puritanical, usually white liberal performative people who are driven by a need to perform well. Interestingly, the people who are most likely to perpetrate the very thing that um, these folks are complaining about are kind of the same people. So you get the people saying, oh no, woke authoritarianism is bad because it's all performative. That's why I had to leave the left. Are usually complaining about the people who are just like them but more successful at it. Let me explain. These folks are complaining about the performative uh, sort of a performative white liberalism usually who are looking at this as a performance game who then jump on those who can't perform the game well saying gotcha playing kind of a gotcha version of quote-unquote wokeism now the people who are most likely to gatekeep purely from some sort of rules-based fundamentalist framework of performativism are performative white liberals who see it as sort of personal morality because they don't have any other thing in it for themselves. Right? So as a trans woman, I have something in it for myself for having uh, very queer affirming spaces because my safety is online. If I were a cishet dude, why would I care about this? I would care about this because I want to be a good ally, right? I might care about it for other reasons, and that would take a lot of deeper digging, right? But if I were only caring about it because I wanted to be seen as a good person, and I were anxiously doing it for moralistic reasons, right? Then I'd be doing it... Then I would have a vested interest in being seen as playing the game well, and I would jump on other people who aren't playing the game well. If I did, and I were playing the game well, then I would get, gain social prestige. Okay? So, because I'd be performing well. And if I weren't playing the game well, and started feeling alienated, then I'd get pushed out, and then I'd start saying, oh, look at those fuckers. To me, these are all the same kind of people. And it's why white performative liberals in social justice spaces are always seen in different group like it's with suspicion and so this is true of me in um, like black lives matter spaces i'd be seen with this sort of suspicion any sort of space where people that want to be allies are in um, are going to be seen with suspicion because people are going to be looking to see why are you there because if you're there because you want to be seen as a good person or you want to be doing the right thing and that's the only reason you're there at some point, um, if you get burnt out, you can like leave the movement angrily and throw people under the bus um, and then become kind of fashy. That's what's happened with a lot of people. I've seen a lot of people become really fascistic in the last you know, five years because they got burnt out on this stuff. And suddenly they took a turn and shifted into a whole new direction because they couldn't play the game well and out of some sort of like weird... Um, for like psychological reasons, they end up turning on movements they used to be a part of. And they spiritualize it sometimes. What's required is going deeper and starting realizing the properly selfish reasons why you should be a part of that movement. Okay? The reason why it's in your best interest as a white person to care about Black Lives Matter is because um, whiteness is toxic for white people. By whiteness, I mean the social systems that whiteness as a social construct created, which is not the same as being German or Irish or Scottish, which have cultural content, but whiteness as a superstructure, as a colonialist superstructure. We should all want to destroy that. It's tied up with the construction of colonization and capitalism and Christian supremacy. Those things are bad. We should want to undo them. 
destroy them and replace them with something life-giving. So the more we realize that and what the life-giving alternatives are, and the more we find that connecting in common cause with different groups is life-giving, the more that comes off when we're in these spaces and we become complicit in these movements for liberation. And the more that is seen, the more we're seen as trustful. Now, as a queer person working for trans liberation, the more I see anxious cis people around me worrying about if they're going to say the right thing as their primary motive, I can tell, I can pick up on those of you who are around me anxious about being a good ally, and which of you who are just realizing, like, how the cis heteropatriarchy is messed up and is bad for everybody, and how we all need a little bit of queer trans magic in our lives. And I can, so I can tell which of you are just trying to perform around me, and which of you are drawn to me because you find there's something healing about it. 